my beautiful people. Now, welcome back again to my channel. Today, I go to tell on the history of Ishakiri people. Yes, for my last video, I talked about the prehistory of the Ginua of Ishekiri. So for this video now, I go to talk about the history of the Ishekiri people. I beg go make you listen as I the starter now. I don't want to waste your time. Once upon a time in the 15th century, there lived a hot-blooded and self-willed young man known as Prince Iginua. Prince Iginua was the elder son of Oba Olua, the 14th Oba of Bene, Bene Kingdom. He was well loved by his father, the king, but disliked by the chiefs because he was impatient of the taboos and traditional convictions of the times. And not willing to wait for his time as an Oba to come before doing away with that which he considered as wrong. He paraded gangs of fellow hot heads and began a frequent terrorization on the chiefs and their supporters. As a result of this, the provoked chiefs who already harbored a dislike for him conversed secretly. The meeting was presided by the chief minister, Iyashe. A consensus would be reached. The young prince Ginua and his associates are to be eliminated. Traditionally, it is a custom of the Bene Kingdom for the son who was chosen Idiake Crown Prince to live outside the capital among the hereditary chiefs to whose ranks he belonged. This was the reason that made it possible for the young prince to carry out his crusade without the Contentment of his father, Oba Olua, and likewise the decision of the chiefs. However, upon hearing the secret conclusion of what was likely to happen to his son, Oba Olua consulted his chief priest, Ogefa, as to what must be done to save the life of his boy. An innovative way of smuggling the prince out of the kingdom as soon as possible was a counsel the priest gave the king after consulting the oracle. Without further hesitation, Obaola ordered an ark of Iroko wood to be hastily constructed, an, an ark big enough to convey not only the prince but also the elder sons of the 70 ships of Benin. With this intention, a meeting of the Central Council was summoned when the Ark was completed. Oba Olua informed the chiefs that he was sending his son, Prince Iginua, to perform desirable rites to the river goddess Oloku, and to accompany him, he demanded from them their first son. The king has spoken, and from the council, no objection was made. So, it happened that when the appointed day came, except for the Oba, the chief priest, and the palace attender who bettered the escape plan, every other person, including the chiefs, didn't know that Prince Iginua and his Etwage, their sons were embarking on a voyage they would never return. And in their ignorance, they joined the Oba in wishing the prince safety and good luck on his journey in Edo language by saying, O Kiewereo. Thereupon, the ark was carried by slaves through the dense forest which span across the present route of Sapele for days. Upon arrival at the banks of River Ethiop, the Iroko ark was lowered and Prince Iginua came out, adore himself with the regalia of kingship and assumed the role of one. The rugged prince made himself a king without a kingdom. However, after a long wait, 
the Benin chiefs got to realize that they have been deluded by their king, and their next line of action was to dispatch soldiers to bring Prince Iginua and their sons back to the kingdom. Somehow information would reach the prince that an outlaw for him was on. Upon hearing this, he ordered a quick evacuation as he instructed them to board the ark. And from Ubiaregi, where it is believed the prince and his retinue had first settled, they said to Efurope, but not being satisfied with the safety of the new place of settlement, the prince king launched another voyage. But this time, the voyage would be long, tedious, and difficult. History has refused to tell us precisely how long it took the prince and his royal etoish to sail through the high waves of the Focados River, and we, in return, are in no position to question why. Nonetheless, it came to be that the assail led them to the small settlement of Amatu, where they squatted for a prolonged while. It is said that Amatu was a place of beauty and wonder. Its glittery white sand was bare to crocodiles and alligators. The sunbeam was soothing to the skin and the air, a pleasure to his aid. But then, these men were sojourners and not tourists. Food to them was far more important than the splendor of nation. Amatu, with all its wonders, was unproductive. They were, however, more fertile headlands inhabited by the Ijaws. Oru Selemo was one of them. A cordial relationship with the royal Etoridge was bettered as a result of the accommodating spirits of the Ijaws. Thus, Oru Selemo did not only become their home. Prince Iginuwa also married an Ijaw woman named Deromo. Incidentally, after several years at Oruselemo, a dispute arose between the migrants and the Ijaws of Gulani, Ogulaga, on the account of the woman, the rumor, the hot temper prince had killed her. And the cordiality that existed between the royal Eturage and the Ijaws was replaced with coldness. It is as a result of this that the prince king in his wisdom thought it more reasonable to move again. The ark was launched and more votage was embarked. They say past the present site of Okados and Burutu as the ark stared not into the Wari River. It is said that the days of this particular quest were not only filled with strain and misery, depression and gloominess also taught it fit to take comfort in their souls. After days of hardship, Prince Iginuwa and his Etoridge finally landed at a virgin land that would be later known as Ijala. And as now he had become the father of two fine boys, Prince Ijije and Prince Irame, they would raise a mini town and settle there. But not long after they found comfort, news of their whereabouts reached Bini, and as expected, an army was sent to bring back the Rony Prince. It should be emphasized here that this was the era when men were more spiritually inclined and owing to this, messages will always find ways to deliver themselves. The information had come to them at Ijala and without his hesitation, the mobile kingdom started making preparation for another evacuation. But exertion has made weary the soul of their commander, King Iginuwa would not make it out of Ijala. He joined his ancestors amidst the preparation, and there he was buried. It is for this reason that Ijala had become the only burial place of Olu's Ishakiri kings since 1500 AD. Tindate. Certainly, there was no time for exaggerated money. Danger was fast approaching. Primogeniture would 
help pave the way for Prince Ijije to take up the royal command and without objection, the honor of a king was duly accorded him. Thus, the planned movement from Ijala was therefore executed by Prince Ijije with the aid of an Idibie, medicine man or a diviner, who threw a magical spear, Ega or Esoro that was believed to have landed at a location called Okotomu, now Ode Shekiri, Big Worry. The tracing of that spear by Prince Ijije and his people, with the help of the Dibye, finally brought them to the spear's location. Historically, the Shekiris are painted as a collection of people with diverse origin, a people with complex mixture, different ethnic cities, and many races. According to Jackson, Omasho, Juwa, Ireye Foju, and Florence, Ireye Foju, in their seminal work, if a Rako in Shekiri social system of Nigeria, Ishekiri people came from Egypt. After the Battle of Achum in 31st BC, the Mahim arrived and settled in the present Wari Kingdom in about 28 BC in Borodo, Ureju, and Ode Shekiri. The leaders of the teams were Iset, Iweret, and Ipi. This part of Ishekiri history is one that cannot be kicked aside as there are more similarity in Shekiri language and custom with those of the ancient Egyptians than any other civilization in the world. The people Iset, Ipi, Shekiri, and Iweret came with some religions. Most of the gods were of the water. In a book titled History of the Shekiri, written by a renowned Ishekiri historian, William A. Moray, gave some revelations. He wrote, Prior to the advent of the Bini Prince Iginua, the territory now known as the Kingdom of Ishekiri or Iwere was inhabited by three tribes, namely Ijos, Urobos, and the Mahims. Also, according to another school of thought, during the time when the struggle for kingdom carving was at its peak, various communities in the Yoruba kingdom were engaged in intercommunal war. As a result of this, streams of migration flowed in from Ijebode, Akure, and Owo. They found their way into the kingdom which then was not a kingdom to settle in various parts including Ureji and Uborodo. This, uh, this should explain the mystic affinity between the Shekiri language and Ijebu. It is also said that groups from Igala in Nupe country came in through the creek. It was during the days this exodus that one FIFA Wadobo and his brother Ishekiri migrated along others from Keremu to Ijalosa. So my people, this year I will stop today. Thank you so much for watching. Please, if you have any contribution to this thing, just put it in the comment section. I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.